We're going to read a story about Abraham and Isaac today. And it's a story that is often disturbing to a lot of people. So we're going to take a look at it and see what God has to say to us by it. Genesis 22, starting at verse 1. After these things, God tested Abraham and said to him, Abraham, and he said, here I am. He said, take your son, your only son, Isaac, whom you love, and go to the land of Moriah and offer him there as a burnt offering on one of the mountains of which I shall tell you. So Abraham rose early in the morning, saddled his donkey, and took two of his young men with him and his son Isaac. And he cut the wood for the burnt offering and arose and went to the place of which God had told him. On the third day, Abraham lifted up his eyes and saw the place from afar. Then Abraham said to his young men, Stay here with the donkey. I and the boy will go over there and worship and come to you again. And Abraham took the wood of the burnt offering and laid it on Isaac his son. And he took his hand, the fire, and the knife. So they went, both of them together. And Isaac said to his father Abraham, My father? And he said, Here I am, my son. He said, Behold, the fire and the wood, but where is the lamb for a burnt offering? Abraham said, God will provide for himself the lamb for a burnt offering, my son. So they went, both of them, together. When they came to the place of which God had told him, Abraham built the altar there and laid the wood in order and bound Isaac his son and laid him on the altar on top of the wood. Then Abraham reached out his hand and took the knife to slaughter his son. But the angel of the Lord called to him from heaven and said, Abraham, Abraham. And he said, Here I am. He said, Do not lay your hand on the boy or do anything to him. For now I know that you fear God, seeing that you have not withheld your son, your only son, from me. And Abraham lifted up his eyes and looked, and behold, behind him was a ram caught in a thicket by its horns. And Abraham went and took the ram and offered it up as a burnt offering instead of his son. So Abraham called the name of that place, The Lord Will Provide. As it is said to this day, on the mount of the Lord it shall be provided. And the angel of the Lord called to Abraham a second time from heaven and said, By myself I have sworn, declares the Lord, because you have done this and if you have not withheld your son, your only son, I will surely bless you and I will surely multiply your offspring as the stars of heaven and as the sand that is on the seashore. And your offspring shall possess the gates of his enemies. And in your offspring shall all the nations of the earth be blessed, because you have obeyed my voice. So Abraham returned to his young men, and they arose and went together to Beersheba. And Abraham lived at Beersheba. This story is often presented as Abraham's test. God is testing Abraham. But I want to call your attention to Isaac today in this story. Isaac is actually the unsung hero of this story. Usually we're focusing on Abraham and the text kind of comes at it from Abraham's angle. But I want to present Isaac to you in this story today. Now, it is a disturbing story that God would ask Abraham to sacrifice his son like that. I'm going to address some of those, some of those uh, concerns a little later. But for now, let's just spend some time in the horror of that situation that Abraham and Isaac found themselves in and what was going on there. Both of them, Abraham and Isaac, as much as Abraham, Isaac had to believe and trust God. They both had to trust. Isaac had to trust just as much as Abraham. He had to go forward in faith in this story. And as much as Abraham is praised later in the New Testament for his willingness to go even this far in doing what God wanted him to do, all of that praise really needs to be extended to Isaac also. And I'm going to explain what I mean here. If you look at verse 7, it says there, 
Behold, the fire and the wood, but where is the lamb for a burnt offering? So says Isaac to Abraham. Verse 7 here shows Isaac knew was, was about to happen. He was putting two and two together here. He could see that we were, going about, we're going up to this hill to sacrifice, and we've got everything except an animal for a burnt offering. Now, this is not Isaac's first sacrifice. He knows what this is about, what's going on. And he's seeing that there's no animal. You need an animal for a sacrifice. So he asks, So, Dad, see, we got everything else here, but we don't have an animal to sacrifice. What's going on? Now, Isaac was not, not uh, a dumb guy. At this time, Isaac was a fully grown man. He was not five or six. It says in verse 1 of what we just read, it says, after these things, which means an indefinite period of time, so it doesn't give an exact amount of time. But Isaac is certainly old enough to carry a load of wood, and he's certainly old enough to put two and two together about what's about to happen. And according to our earliest sources, Isaac, according to one source, was 25 years old. Or according to early Jewish tradition, he was 37 years old. So one way or the other, he was a fully grown man. He was an adult. He knew enough to recognize what was going on. He was old enough to carry this load of wood that he had on his back. So we have Isaac, who was a fully grown man. And we have Abraham, who was a very old man. It says that Abraham was 100 years old at Isaac's birth. So if Isaac was 25, Abraham would be 125. If Isaac was 37, Abraham would be 137. Simple math there. So what we have here, it's pretty easy to conclude. Isaac could have easily escaped. Easily. A 25-year-old versus a man 125 years old, not much of a contest. Or 37 versus 137, not much of a contest. Isaac could have gotten away. Easy. Isaac knew what was about to happen. Plus, Isaac was strong enough to resist or to escape. Isaac is a hero of faith just as much as Abraham. Isaac had to believe that the old man had not lost his mind here. He had to believe and trust God. He had to go against all kinds of common sense here for his faith. Isaac had to believe that somehow God would provide this lamb. Just like his dad had said. Because God had made this promise that through Isaac, Abraham's children would be many. Now Isaac wasn't married yet. He didn't have any kids yet. So if he died then, that would kind of short circuit that promise. So something's got to happen. God has to come through somehow. So Isaac had to believe this just as much as Abraham did. And especially to go along with all of this. Isaac had to believe that somehow, even in all of this, God was still loving and good. Otherwise, he wouldn't have gone along. If God is, I mean, and this goes for the rest of us too. If God is not loving, and he's not good, and he's not just, then we would have no reason to follow him. We follow him, we put our trust in him because we know he loves us and we know he's good and we know he's just. And if Isaac didn't believe these things, Isaac would have taken off. Like, all right, God's not on my side. Dad's not on my side. 
I'm going to be on my own. I'm just going to try to survive. So look at, look at the screen here. There's a, this is from Hebrews 11. This is in the New Testament. It reflects back on this story. It says, By faith Abraham, when God tested him, offered Isaac as a sacrifice. He who had received the promises was about to sacrifice his one and only son. Even though God had said to him, it is through Isaac that your offspring will be reckoned, Abraham reasoned that God could raise the dead. And figuratively speaking, he did receive Isaac back from death. But all of that, even though that's framed from Abraham's perspective, this could really also be presented from Isaac's perspective too. Isaac had to also reason that God could raise the dead. Now this was before there was a resurrection in Jesus. So there was no precedent for this. So Isaac had to believe that somehow. And he, even figuratively speaking, he received his own life back from death. So Isaac was truly in the line of Christ here. This story here foreshadows his coming and or his coming uh, descendant, rather, who is Jesus Christ as we know him. Isaac was his father's only son, just like Jesus. For God so loved the world that he gave one of his many sons, no, his one and only son, and that was Isaac. And Isaac carried the wood for his own sacrifice. It says in John 19, verse 17, that Jesus carried his own cross and he went out to the place of the skull where he was crucified. It says in the other Gospels that Simon of Cyrene carried his cross, but we have John here that he started at least carrying his own cross. So, Jesus had to carry the wood for his own sacrifice, just like Isaac did. And Isaac went expecting death at a place that would later be called Jerusalem. This Mount Moriah is, as best that we know anyways, is the place where the temple was built. That temple was in Jerusalem. So, Isaac is going to Jerusalem knowing that he is going to be facing his death there. It says in Matthew 16.21 that from that time on, Jesus began to explain to his disciples ahead of time that he must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things at the hands of the elders, chief priests, and teachers of the law, and that he must be killed, and that on the third day be raised to life. So Jesus... On that last trip to Jerusalem, he knew he was going there, and he knew that he was going there to die. He wasn't gonna he wasn't gonna escape that. But one more thing that makes Isaac truly in the line of Christ here. Isaac voluntarily went along with the plan. He did it under his own free will. He didn't have to. He chose to. This is not a story of child abuse here. Because Isaac freely went as a fully grown adult. If Isaac had overpowered his father and fled, we would not have blamed him for a second. We would probably think, yep, I would have done the same thing. But Isaac voluntarily went along with this plan, as outrageous as it would have seemed. And Jesus did the same thing. There are some people out there, I've heard this argument, that the, the sacrifice of Christ on the cross is kind of a, an act of divine child abuse, where God the Father beat His own Son literally to hell for everybody else. And that is blatantly false. That is not true at all. Jesus went along voluntarily through this plan. Matthew 26, 53 and 54. He is about, he's being arrested 
And Peter is trying to fight for him so that Jesus can escape arrest. And he tells him to put his sword back in his place. And then he says, Do you think I cannot call on my Father, and He will at once put at my disposal more than twelve legions of angels? He's going to call on His Father, and His Father would do it. If Jesus at any time said, Father, I'm, I don't think I'm up for this after all. Could you send me those angels? He would have had them right then. Isaac and Jesus voluntarily went along with this plan by their own free will. Okay, now just, just a couple things to mention here, just about the horror that this story really is. I want to say one thing first of all. It was never God's intention that Abraham would kill Isaac. That was never God's intention. God did not change his mind here. In Jeremiah, one of the prophets, when Israel had kind of hit this moral deterioration so bad that they were even sacrificing their own children to pagan gods, God is livid about this. And three times in Jeremiah, he says something like this here. Jeremiah 32, 35. Here's just one example. There's two other times. This is God talking. They have built the high places of Baal in the valley of the son of Himmon to offer up their sons and daughters to Molech. Though I did not command them, nor did it enter my mind that they should do this abomination. It's never even entered my mind that they would do this. It was never God's intention that Abraham would actually sacrifice Isaac like that. Now, there are people in the not too recent past, or not too distant past rather, that have actually killed their children thinking that God told them to. So I want to put this out there. If you think that God is telling you to kill your children, then that's not God at all. God very explicitly condemns and forbids child sacrifice many times in the Old Testament. But there are people who have actually done that. One of them was in Muskegon in 1987, actually. I remember I was only eight years old at the time, but I remember people talking about that, how shocking that was. God forbids very clearly child sacrifice. And in Jeremiah, he is livid about this. If there is any thought that this might be you, that's not God. It's not God. Go talk to a mental health professional. Okay? And moreover, Christ on the cross is the sacrifice to end all sacrifices. There is no need for sacrifices anymore. All of those Old Testament animal sacrifices were meant to point to Jesus as the ultimate sacrifice. So we don't have to do that anymore. There's a reason why we don't offer animals as sacrifices here anymore. Jesus did it. It's done. We don't have to do that anymore. You could actually make a case to say that this story is precedent for banning human sacrifices because human sacrifice was actually practiced all over the ancient world. There is evidence for it in all corners of the world, all over the place, going that far back anyways. What we have here is a place where a divine being says, no, don't do it. So what you have here is a precedent to forbid human sacrifice. And later, when God gives the law, that would become more explicit. God is not into human sacrifice. There's one sacrifice, and that's all we need. Let's look at uh, the screen here, and let's answer this together. Can another creature, any at all, pay this debt of sin for us? 
No. To begin with, God will not punish another creature for what a human is guilty of. Besides, no mere creature can bear the weight of God's eternal anger against sin and release others from it. And then, one more here. What kind of mediator and deliverer should we look for then? One who is truly human and truly righteous, yet more powerful than all creatures. That is, one who is also true God. Alright, so if it wasn't God's intention that Abraham would go through with this, then is God playing some cruel joke here? I mean, what, a, what an awful test to put on somebody that supposedly you care about to command them to sacrifice their only son like that? Well, let me put this out there for your consideration. If you're an atheist or a skeptic, there is nothing that is going to satisfy you on that explanation. There's no explanation that I could give that would assuage all those concerns. But for believers, if you believe in Jesus and your trust is in Him as Savior, each of us are called to be living sacrifices to God. Each one of us. Romans 12, verse 1. Therefore, I urge you, brothers, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as living sacrifices, holy and pleasing to God. This is your spiritual act of worship. We're all believers called to do this. This should be our whole life. One just small example of this, when I was in high school and I was working my two minimum wage jobs, trying to save money, and I also had a car to buy, and I had uh, CDs that I wanted, and I had movies that I wanted to see, and friends to hang out with and stuff. But I decided that I wanted to tithe. Because tithing meant that everything that I have belongs to God. I'm going to give Him 10% before taxes to the church and, and to His work in the world. And so, I do remember one time thinking... I, had, I would always cash my checks, and I had these envelopes. And uh, I would, this, this cash would just kind of build up in these envelopes because I was saving and such. And, and uh, somebody said say to me once, don't you believe in banks? Because I had quite a bit of cash there. But I had, I had all of this, and so this cash would build up in, in the tithing envelope too. And I, and I remember thinking one time, you know, if I didn't do this, I could have this many more CDs now. I could get my car this much sooner. You know how many movies I could see with this money that I'm giving to the church? But I remember thinking, okay, I'm not going to go there though because the reason why I have a job and I have this money is because God provided it for me. I need to remember that everything that I have belongs to Him. My, my whole life is a living sacrifice to Him, so I'm, I'm going to set this aside, no matter what I can buy with it. That's His. And by this, this is going to be a token of my life as a living sacrifice to Him, or one example of that. That's a small example. There are some people who have to actually give their lives because... Of Jesus. They'll have a gun to their head. Are you a Christian? And they'll say yes. And the trigger will be pulled. There's people out there who have to go through that. Jesus said though, and this puts it in perspective, the one who loses his life for me is the one who truly lives. The whole Bible, again and again, implies 
that life is not a beating heart and brain waves. That's not what life is. Life is knowing and belonging to Jesus. If you have that connection with him, then you will live even if you don't have a beating heart or brain waves. You will continue to live. And not only will you continue to live, but you will have life that is truly life. Jesus said this many times. Matthew 16, 24 through 25, If anyone would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whoever would save his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. And he says it many other places too. I just have four examples there on the screen. If you want to follow me, this is my road. And if you want to really live, then surrender your life to this, to me, to this path that I'm walking. If you don't believe me, give it a try. So this story, this difficult story of Abraham and Isaac here, this is a story that separates the true believers from the casual believers, really. Because anybody who reads this story and has in their heart some things that are more important than God, whether that be family or self or job or anything else, if, if people, if you have on your heart something higher than God in this story, then you are not going to be able to accept this. What kind of a God would, would make me do this? Or have this out there? What kind of a God would play this cruel joke? But Jesus even comes before family. And he said this too. Matthew 10, 37-38 Whoever loves his father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. And whoever loves son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. And whoever does not take his cross and follow me is not worthy of me. That's a, that's a really high bar. To put that on everybody, you know, I am higher than family. I am higher than even your very life. There's only one person who could really make that kind of claim and to have it be valid, and that's if Jesus was the Son of God himself. No other human being would ever have any authority to put, any, would put this kind of requirements on any of us. If your employer tries to say something like this to you, or a teacher, or anything, no. That would be the point where you'd say, no. No, you are not my God. But if Jesus is the Son of God, then He is more important than your family and your very life. And we need to surrender it all to Him. Isaac's story of going to the altar is the same story, actually, of every believer submitting their lives to God's will. If you're a believer in Jesus and you are following Him and you are trusting Him, then this story where Isaac goes along here, this is our story too. We have to put our trust in the Lord. We have to surrender our lives as living sacrifices to Him. Psalm 40, verse 4, it says, Blessed is the man who makes the Lord his trust, who does not turn to the proud, to those who go astray after a lie. Everything else that would take the place of God is really a lie. So like Isaac, some challenges for each of us today. Follow Jesus no matter the cost. Walk his road no matter how much it costs you. No matter how difficult it is. Keep walking that road. Surrender your life. Surrender your interests. Surrender your ambitions. Surrender your hopes and dreams. Surrender your sexuality. Surrender your money. Give it all to him. It's all his. And walk that road. It's not an easy road. But it's the road that leads to true life. 
follow Jesus no matter the cost. He gave it all up for us and says, this is the way to go. Follow me. If you believe that he knows what he's talking about, then follow in his footsteps. Trust that God is loving and just even when he doesn't make sense. There's been many times when I've sat with many of you in difficult times when God doesn't make sense. When something terrible just just happens out of the blue or there's some disease or sickness or, or death and God does not make sense right now. Isaac had to believe that God was loving and just even in an outrageous moment like that. We can do it too. Faith means following God's commands even if they don't add up. Faith means believing when God doesn't make sense. And faith means believing and walking that painful road of Jesus even when it hurts. This is what Isaac did. This is what Jesus did. This is what we do too. And trust that Jesus is God's lamb that saves you like Isaac. Don't make Jesus the unsung hero of your story. Trust in Him. I'm going to close with Psalm 9, verse 10. Those who know your name put their trust in you. For you, O Lord, have not forsaken those who seek you. He doesn't leave us. He doesn't forsake us. Put your trust in Him. Let's bow our heads and let's pray. Lord, our God in heaven, Lord, this is a story that disturbs us. Lord, we, we want to put our trust in you. We want to put you above all other things. But Lord, help us to do that. Help us to walk in these footsteps of Jesus that are before us, each one of us. We're in different places of, of life. We have different challenges and you give us different roads to walk. So Lord, whatever is the road before each of us today, help us to walk that road, whether it's easy or hard, whether it makes sense or doesn't. And Lord, putting our trust the whole time in Jesus who is our salvation. And we pray in Jesus' name, amen.